Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and SoundCloud at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and on Tumblr at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. You can support this podcast and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my monthly bonus podcast, Beer of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. That was a pretty hectic week for me. Um, half week, I guess. Uh, Wednesday and Thursday, I was down in Washington for lobbying and a congressional hearing that had some batshit crazy moments in it, um, including a New Jersey Democratic rep busting the GOP leadership's balls on the um, the hidden replacement bill for the Affordable Care Act. Um, it literally included a moment where he said, I can't look at this version. You've got it hidden somewhere in the basement. My Democratic colleagues can't look at it. Maybe the Russian ambassador is allowed to look at it. So that that kind of raised the stakes as to how much you're allowed to laugh when you're in the audience for one of these things. And luckily, I was in the audience not testifying at some point. I imagine I will have to be testifying. But anyway, um, after that. Uh, Thursday, uh, there's a train ride back to New Jersey and then a drive into New York City for the kickoff event for the Festival New Literature, which we previewed last week with my conversation with Garth Greenwell. Uh, that ran Thursday through Sunday. Organizers told me it went great. I didn't go back into the city after Thursday because, well, you'll find out. Um, they also said the queer as Volk theme uh, worked really well. They're really happy with uh, the turnout for all of the events. So anyway, I got to the kickoff just in time for the presentation of the Friedrich Ulfers Prize, which is given to, and I quote, a publisher, writer, critic, translator, or scholar who has championed the advancement of German language literature in the United States. Now, my timing on this is fortunate because this week's guest is the winner of the 2017 Friedrich Ulfers Prize, but more on that in a minute. Um, I had a great time at the kickoff event. I got to catch up with old pals like Richard Gare. Um, who's a past guest of the show. His girlfriend, Susan Barnofsky, was part of this year's Festival New Literature event. If you didn't listen to last week's, it's this event um, that brings in German language authors from Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, uh, pairs them up with um, English language authors over a three-day stretch of various literary panels. Uh, it also includes the translators, so there's a big conversation about bringing German language lit uh, into the Anglo world. Um, anyway, I got involved with it last year, had a great time this time around. I got to interview the chairperson last week in Garth and this time around the, um, the winner of the Friedrich Ulfers prize, who I promise we'll get to. Um, but it was kind of disorienting to go from like Capitol Hill stuff to the, the Goethe Institute and have that wormhole of the, the Holland tunnel in between. Um, it is somewhat, disorienting, uh, like I said, being in a suit and tie and kind of having the day job mode going on. But one of the neat things that I realized during the, the, the kickoff thing and the reception after is that my being in a suit and tie is actually disorienting to literary and publishing people. So that kind of offset, they were off kilter too. So that made me seem a little bit more balanced. Um, it was kind of a neat thing to observe, but all of that aside, congressional hearings, uh, festivals, uh, literary festivals, etc. The big event of the weekend was the arrival of the newest member of the Virtual Memory Show production team, Bendico Fabrizio Roth. Um, 
we didn't have a kid. Bendico is a greyhound, which is the closest I'm ever going to come to having a kid. Uh, his key role is going to be taking me out for, for walkies periodically. Um, and on the rare occasion that we record an episode here at home, he'll be making our guests just fawn all over him. Um, Bendico is adorable. There's a picture of him in this week's email. And if you don't subscribe to that, you ought to. Uh, there's a sign-up form on our websites, vmspod.com and chimeraobscura.com slash vm. The name, which I'm sure you're you're wondering about, because my two previous greyhounds were named after Groucho Marx characters, Rufus T. Firefly and Otis B. Driftwood, uh, Bendico is named after the dog of Prince Fabrizio in The Leopard, one of my favorite novels by Giuseppe di Lampedusa. So there is sort of a translation thing coming in here, which is part of the vibe of this whole show. Um, anyway, we just got Bendico. Uh, it was a hectic half week all around, and we're all getting accustomed to each other at this point. He's getting accustomed to life in a house for the first time. Uh, I'm getting accustomed to walking a greyhound who isn't even three years old yet. Uh, there's a lot of training to be done. If you hear any weird whining or barking in the background, it's not me. It's it's him. So, Anyway, back to the Friedrich Olfers Prize, which is sort of the point of this show. This year's winner is Barbara Epler, the president and publisher of New Directions, the famed independent literary house. Uh, New Directions brought a lot of great work out in translation over the decades, and their their German language highlights include uh, Sebald, Walser, The Other Roth, not me or Philip, but Joseph, uh, and Jenny Erpenbeck. But um, the thing was, the organizers of the festival asked me if I'd be interested in recording with Barbara. I plots. I looked over my bookshelves. I started counting all the New Directions titles that are up there. Um, and I just wrote back, when? Where? Uh, when was two weekends ago. Where, awesomely, was the New Directions offices in the West Village? Um, that was sort of like heaven for me. And I know I talked about that when I went to the Farrar strauss Garo offices to interview Jonathan Galassi two years ago. Um, this place is even neater because it's it's more constrained um, there are a number of limitations around New Directions, which Barbara and I talk about uh, based on the the will of the founder, James Lachlan. Um, but but just being in these these little offices, not little, these these nice offices on, on 14th and seeing like 80 years worth of literary continuity from from Lachlan's founding back in 36 up through now. It was just a joy. Um it did make me kind of wonder during the drive home about life choices back when I was in my mid twenties and looking for a job and, and whether I should have gone into publishing instead of trade magazines and blah, 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 blah. Um, the upshot is I didn't. And here I am. Um, the other great thing about Barbara's office, uh, in addition to all the books and everything else was the view from the balcony, which she showed off before we got started and which I've posted a picture of on the Instagram feed for the podcast. And that's, uh, Instagram.com slash VMS pod. Um, you'll see. That's all I got to say. Not much by way of caveats in this one, uh, standard New York city noise, but deal. Um, really I'm only bummed that Barbara had an appointment right after and didn't have more time to talk, but I'm sort of hoping we'll do a follow-up sometime. Here's Barbara's bio from the Festival New Literature site. Her bio at the New Directions website, which is ndbooks.com, is tiny, so we're going to go with this one instead. Barbara Epler started working at New Directions after graduating from Harvard in 1984 and is now the publisher. The writers Epler has published include such international luminaries, and you're going to love my pronunciations of this, as W.G. Sebald, Roberto Bolaño, Laszlo, Laszlo Krasnohorkai, Robert Valser, Clarice Lispector, Yoko, Yoko Tawada, Cesar Ira, Inger Christensen, Franz Kafka, Joel Hoffman, Bay Dao, Thomas Transtromer, Jenny Erpenbeck, Veza Canetti, Fleur Yegi, Raduan Nasser, Joseph Roth, Takashi Hiraidi, maybe, Alexander Kluge, and Antonio Tabucci. She has worked with some of the world's most gifted translators and has served as a judge for the Penheim Translation Fund Awards. In 2015, poets and writers awarded Epler their Editor's Prize, and in 2016, Words Without Borders gave her the Ottawa Award for the Promotion of International Literature. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Barbara Epler.
Do you want me to start, uh, let's see, profound or mean-spirited? <laughs> I don't know. Mean-spirited sounds kind of fun. Okay. Mean-spirited <laughs> is you and I actually have something in common, which is uh, we both published Paul West, mm -hmm. who may be the least sellable author <laughs> I've ever had as, as a small press publisher. And I'm not going to ask you to, to, to put his, his titles on the spot, but um, I will say that when I had a ton of books left behind by Paul mm -hmm. West – uh, Daedalus books, those, those, um, refuse to take it on because as the owner said, my wife will kill me if I bring in any more Paul West books. So, <laughs> so anyway, from that part, uh, starting point, we do have something, something in common, which is mean spirited. Proud publishers. Yeah. <laughs> I was a uh, very, very small press once upon a time, but, um, the profound part that I, I want to bring up is, well, there's a line from, of Hegel quoting Goethe or misquoting Goethe, um, where he says, whoever aspires to great things must learn to limit himself. And my question to you is, how important are the limits that are on New Directions in terms of what you guys achieve and what you've achieved over 80-plus years at this point? I mean, maybe like everything, the limits sort of define what we do. Because, yeah. um, you know, we're, made, we're for profit, so we have to sink or swim, we have to make money. Um, but we don't do anything that really overtly would look like it makes money, except Tennessee Williams. And so yeah. Tennessee Williams and his generosity have allowed us to keep going despite really huge limitations. Um, so there's nine of us. We print about, we publish about 40 new books a year, and for them, you know, we have very small initial budgets. And so we're limited to the fact that we can't publish anyone who's already been discovered doesn't make any sense you know so usually it's people that aren't haven't been in English yet or um, especially in terms of fiction in translation and then with poetry it's it's a little different because they're more um, people we've published often and keep publishing and so it kind of goes on but mm -hmm. the limits are size of staff um, how much money we have um, how we feel we can spend the money but then on the other hand there's no limit because nobody's telling us what to do. Mm -hmm. um, Hence the aspire to greatness. <laughs> the aspire to greatness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, you know, James Lachlan started New Directions in 1936 and kind of out the gate was publishing really gr greatness itself and, um, and continued to do so. And so when he passed away, one of the sort of directives was for us to keep going is to publish um, basically the same amount of books per year, the same sort of balance of poetry and fiction and that it would be of the same quality as what he published. Mm -hmm. It's like setting the bar pretty high. <laughs> How well do you think you met that goal? Well, um, we try. I mean, we certainly published some wonderful people. Um, but when you see that he was the first publisher of people like Borges and Nabokov and Dylan Thomas. I mean, that's, that's it's a pretty high bar. High. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty high. <laughs> in Tennessee and all sorts of people, Lorca and Neruda and mm -hmm. Miller and Mishima. It's pretty high. But... But, you know, I think Cesar Ivers is really wonderful and Laszlo Krasno Harkai and lots, Bolaño and Zabal. Mm -hmm. Pretty fantastic. Yeah. Too. yeah. How has the the business of New Directions changed as as the the realities of the publishing industry, realities of, of audience interests? I know a lot of, from my days as a small mm -hmm. press publisher, it was the, the, the backlist is a very important thing. I didn't last long enough to generate mm -hmm. a real backlist. Um because of the Paul West thing, but <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, but but how have the, in that respect, how has the, the sort of model for how you guys work, how has that had to adjust? Um, well, it's, I mean, we haven't changed that much, but, um, but around us a few things have really changed that are enormous. I mean, thank God, like 10 years ago, it was very scary in terms of like the independent bookstores, mm -hmm. but now they're, and they're kind of our best allies and um, often are really helpful to us with showcasing our books and inviting our authors to read and have events and stuff. But um, so they've survived and they've gotten stronger. And so in a way, that's like a, that's like the happiest um, silver lining thing. But it is a very different world when so many people buy things online. And, um, you know, Amazon is a huge amount of our sales, which we couldn't live without them. Yeah. So, you know, it's a, it's a fact of life thing. And I don't feel so upset about that since, um, you know, the independent bookstores have managed to, f f you know, find ways to say, stay more relevant and, and seem stronger than ever. Um, 
But then the other thing that's changed for us that's huge is we have more, you know, I wouldn't say kind of competition. I mean, there are more and more excellent presses doing the kind of books we do. And so that's a change. There really wasn't um, very many that were, you know, there was like, some, you know, but they would, you know, at counterpoint, and, you know, but they weren't, they weren't thick on the ground, and now they're thick on the ground, and mm-hmm. they're extraordinary, and most of them are small and run by younger people, and constantly there are books that I wish we'd found yeah. before they found them. You know? Generally in translation or Usually English? Usually in translation. Okay. I mean, that's what I, we kind of keep a better eye on in mm-hmm. terms of fiction, and, you know, I don't know, like, I've always loved... um Pedro Paramore, and always thought, Juan Rufo, that's all he wrote. And then I see that Deep Vellum is bringing out The Golden Cockerel and all of these other books. Or like Wakefield, we were thinking about doing Marcel Schwab, and they've already started a Marcel Schwab mm-hmm. series. Or, you know, We'd always th- talked about doing Leonora Carrington's short fiction, and now Dorothy Project has this beautiful, complete one coming. Mm-hmm. You know, so you're like, ah. Oh. So things get away because there are people like Archipelago and Ugly Duckling and I mean, there's a lot of them. Restless, deep I mean, they're yeah. doing extraordinary books. Even the so, New York Review of Books guys. New York Review of yeah. Books are doing great books. And, yeah, you know, and there's Europa and Melville. I mean, they really did. They weren't there ten mm-hmm. years ago. Coffee House was maybe there at the beginning, and yeah. Jill was just starting a while ago. And Gray Wolf is a very different animal than it is now. It's sure. a small. It was a smaller wolf. And, um, so, I mean, I think that it's really good news for America and for the Anglo world readers but mm-hmm. that, that, that's a fact but um but that's a change we were much more singular 10 years ago it strikes me and this will be a very strange comparison yeah. to make unless somebody's already made it for you um it reminded me a little of michael lewis's Moneyball mm-hmm. about the way baseball mm-hmm. spending changed over years where people started to look for undervalued assets uh. that contributed to wins and a few a few teams that figured it out started yeah. investing in these things and uh, succeeding beyond their their budgets, uh, and then everybody else figured out those assets and started going for the the same thing. Mm-hmm. A little bit different in your case, but you know it did strike me as as you know one yeah. of those things where translation is the there's so much great work out there. Yeah, that, that, it has you know, great growth potential. Yeah. yeah, but there's also been all these people doing all this work, like Words Without Borders or like Chad Post up at Open Letter and three percent and. You know, all of these um, different, not, you know, not all straightforwardly publishers, but different cultural players that have really opened it up. Mm -hmm. What's the process like for you guys? Is there a a standard way of of discovering? Or is it really a a matter of serendipity when you start coming across somebody who hasn't been translated previously? It's it's a lot of serendipity, but it's also a lot of... um, you know, just having lots of eyes and ears open and talking to people, um, both people we just, you know, I just met a new Italian publisher yesterday and they had very interesting books. And um, But all of the translators that we've worked with before, we try to ask them what they're reading and what's going on in their languages. And um, we usually sit, one of us tries to be a judge for the Penheim Prize, which is this fantastic, um, every year, I think they give out pen oversees this um, really generous prize of three or $4,000 a piece for something like 10 to 15 tra- translators. And Michael Henry Heim was this fantastic um, mm. professor out at UCLA who we s- published several books from several languages that he translated. And he um, anonymously donated his father's um, GI pension thingy, his mm. death benefit. His mother never touched it. And by the time he donated it, like 10 years before his death, nobody knew it was him. Um, and this is a guy who would, looked like Abraham Lincoln and would walk around with, like, you'd think to yourself, oh, I wish his wife would buy him a better sports coat. <laughs> you know, like, he's a really great guy and really generous. And he wanted to particularly um, inspire younger. Well, he had two goals. One was to inspire younger translators. But the other one was to have some sort of gold star that would enable um, especially corporate publishers to take a risk mm-hmm. and say, because it you off, the editors often hit their marketing department at the big houses, and they're like, you know, we can't pronounce this guy's name. We have enough problems. I was very thankful you did that Hungarian author at the beginning because I still can't pronounce that in the slightest. <laughs> Laszlo. Um, anyhow, and, so, and it worked both ways. I mean, there have been a lot of pickup, but um, that's an incredible gift because there's something between 200 and 400 applications every year, and they only have to translate, I think, 20 or 25 pages. And... Um, we found really great writers like the Iraqi 
American writer Dunya Mikhail and Takashi Hiraidi. We found his poetry, and he went on to publish The Guest Cat, this little novel mm-hmm. that was our first New York Times bestseller oh, wow. since Paul Bowles, <laughs> since the 40s. Um, and also um, Eka Kurniawan, the Indonesian author, who's really great. And we had a big hit with Beauty is a Wound, and uh, Verso and New Directions are both publishing him, and he's really a phenomenal writer and is now in like 30 languages. And because I don't speak any other languages, I'm always given the sort of what nobody can read anyway. <laughs> so Hungarian and Lithuanian and Urdu. And we found a great Urdu author. Um, and is there an untapped market of Finnish literature? That there I'm is sure. Bit, yeah. there's, there's, there's like one very well-known Finnish writer. And that, but there's others really good ones too. Um, and so, yeah, so we just look everywhere. But when you meet these translators, they, they're really a huge source. Mm-hmm. And also friends who work in sort of similar houses all over the world, and they're really useful. And then there are these generous programs, like especially the younger editors like Tynan. Uh, Kogane just came back from Japan, and then before that he was in Rome, and meeting a lot of times with the smaller, more independent publishers who are more likely to publish our kind of books. Mm-hmm. And so and you make these friendships, and it may not be, or like sitting on the Penheim thing, I've often found really great translators. The book isn't right for us. Like it may be a very straightforward kind of family saga novel, which sure. could do really well, and it's a really good book, but it wouldn't do well on our list. But we try to save the translator's name, and then when we have a Chinese novel that needs a good translator, we can try to find her again. Mm-hmm. Was New Directions um, that big in the translation field? From the beginning. From the outset? Okay, so I wasn't sure going over the, the back list if it was... Well, J.L. grew up, yeah. you know, very much... Um, he was board in um, college, he'd gone to Root Choate and had this really wonderful teacher named Dudley Fitz. And Dudley Fitz introduced him when he was bored at Harvard. He left and he went to Europe and he studied with Gertrude Stein and then he enrolled at what was called the Esuversity. And the two of them had a huge impact on him, particularly Ezra Pound. And Ezra believed there was one world and one world literature that anyone who was hoping to understand or have a real intellectual life should know everything. And so JL spoke like French, German, Italian, and had Greek and Latin, and um, German, and um, it was a ski champion. But anyhow, <laughs> he did grow up under this thing with Ezra that you needed to know of everything. And so from the beginning, you know, he was the first publisher here, like Lorca and Neruda, sure. and um, early ones like Borges and Nabokov. And so he, that was from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And all the French poets he brought sure. in, and, and Sartre, and, you know, and then later in Japanese, I mean, in early on Chinese classical literature because of um, Ezra again. Yeah. Is there a degree of trying to balance the English language publications and, and translation, or is it simply merit of the book? It's and kind of merit of the book. I mean, the thing about the, um, I mean, it's it's not a just world, obviously, we all know that, but... Um, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, in it, Understandably, American and English writers are looking for um, a living, and the kind of advances we're offering are no, no way a living. I mm-hmm. mean, a zero percentage of your living can come. I mean, you can get like 2 or 5% off a living out of us. but it depends on where you so, live. Yeah, <laughs> I guess so. And, um, so. and the opposite is true of the, the world writers in that, you know, their primary audience so far has probably been in their home language, and... To get into English, even though it's unfair, means that everyone in the world can read your book. Mm-hmm. And so all of the European and all the world editors read English. And so once it's, you know, like with Eka Kurniawan, he was only in Malay and Chinese and Indonesian. And so, and then we published him in English, and now he's in 30 languages. And you've had the Nobel rush, where a somebody nobody has heard of in America wins a Nobel, and all of a sudden they want the books? Yeah. Well, you know, the last one was Transtromer, and that was really exciting. But we weren't his only publisher. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think we have the best translation. But, well, um, we're, we're not, <laughs> not that we're tooting our own horn. But, the yeah. great enigma. Yeah. Um, but, um, How ready is New Directions when one of those happens? We, we, well, you know, we're always surprised. I mean, we've had a few people on the list for a while, and... Um, you know, now we have five or six different ones and they kind of shift around a little bit, but you're not really. I mean, we had probably about a thousand copies of The Great Enigma. And, um, you know, you go into immediate reprint and then you do this thing where I'm not crazy about doing it, but it's to make it immediately available as a, a print on demand book with Amazon. And, yeah. I mean, it's either that or nobody can get the book. And, right. And 
I'm like everyone else. I remember things for about 30 seconds. So if you don't remember it, when if it's not available when you want it. Yeah. You, you don't add it. it to a list and get around to it six months later. Yeah. I don't. But yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're always hoping. But I was really embarrassed, and now I've read her, and she's so great. Um, I was just checking our we, the lads broke thing a couple of years ago, yeah. and I was like, Svetlana, who with Alexievich? <laughs> I didn't know. I hadn't read her at all. And it's you know being not exactly you know it's not fiction, and so it's not exactly in the middle of my worldview. But she's so great, and um, sad. But, but anyhow, yeah. No, that's what I, I wonder just about the, the practical exigencies of doing this stuff, you know, when mm -hmm. there's suddenly a, a massive rush like that for a press that, you know, cares yeah. and isn't simply, you know, stockpiling tons and yeah, tons yeah. of copies. So. Talk about your, your literary background. I mean, you mentioned being a, a fiction maniac. What was your, your youth um, reading like? Just a big reader. I mean, yeah. starting out, you know really like reading all of Nancy Drew. I mean, mm -hmm. It didn't start out like super sophisticated. but yeah. And I loved Old Mother West Wind as a child. And I remember learning how to read on Dr. Seuss, mm -hmm. um, One Fish, Two Fish. Um, it, so then, you know, I was one of those kids who, I don't know if you remember the, um, what were those? They were the little cloth books. It was the American Library. Or great, the classics. I, shoot, I think it was out of Random House, but... There were these little cloth books, and their end papers were printed with all of the classics. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, I, I kind of You just go through and wanted to, yeah. 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 <laughs> and my family liked to go to garage sales, and there were always, both my parents are teachers, so there were always lots of books. What do they teach? Uh, my father taught the deaf in high school, and my mother taught um, people with learning disabilities, also mm. in high school. Interesting. And, um, yeah, so we just grew up in a house full of books, and um, I loved it. I remembered... You know, reading The Wind in the Willows by myself, and I just love that book. And and when I moved from, you know, pic books with pictures to books with no pictures. And the other thing is, that ki the kind of house where your parents are teachers, is if you're lying around and reading a book, they will leave you in peace. And if they yeah, see you're you not doing causing trouble. nothing or <laughs> watching television, it's definitely time for some chores. So, yeah, so it was also like a nice. playing possum a little bit. Mm -hmm. And what did you study in school? I studied uh, history and literature of the 20th century, um, English and American, because I didn't have another language. Yeah. yeah. So that made it all possible. Mm -hmm. Did New Directions mean something to you before New Directions? Yeah. I mean, well, it meant a couple things. Um, it was certainly like when I couldn't get a job in publishing, I thought I was just going to go into publishing for like a year. And I was trying to stave off my mother who wanted me to go to graduate school very badly. And, um, and that was kind of the idea when I went into school. And then I didn't like the graduate students that I met very much. And so then I thought it'd be easy to get a job in publishing. But at that time, at least women had to touch type. Mm -hmm. And I'd taken shop. I hadn't taken typing. So I couldn't touch type. And you really couldn't get past the what used to be called I don't know, personnel. And I never met anybody. And finally I got frustrated and... And I was also, my mother was like, have you gotten a job yet? And um, so I sent postcards to my favorite publishers. And so I sent one to Penguin. And they wrote me back and said there were no jobs. And then I sent one to New Directions, and I sent one. And that's the only other person I think I sent one to Forest Dress. And the only person that wrote me back was this woman named Griselda Onesian. And it was <laughs> this crazy name. And it was this really witchy letter on old-fashioned letterhead and there was no margin and it was just full it was a full long letter about what a dreadful job it is and all this kitchen work and elbow grease and wearing lots of hats and that you'd spend the rest of your life xeroxing and filing and, and you said that's a job for me yeah. yeah so i ignored it for a while and then yeah. my mother called again and then i called in griselda typically said what are you doing now why don't you come in and so i walked in and um She's just a wonder. She was the managing director and just a great person and, and very direct, the skinny old Yankee. And she met me at the door and said, what do you think of my letter? And I was like, it was really terrible. And she, <laughs> and she was proud of herself. Good. It was meant to be terrible. <laughs> yeah. So um, so she was fun, and she fudged my typing test. And then again, I didn't think I'd be here very long. At what point did you realize you were going to be here for the rest of your career? I didn't. Or really, we hope. I mean, yeah. 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 Um, well, after like five years, I said to Griselda that I was thinking about moving to Los Angeles. I was going through a breakup, and I love L.A. And then a friend who works in the movies thought that he could easily get me a job, basically earning in a, you know, in a month what I was earning here in a year, fixing mm -hmm. scripts. And, um, and so I told her that, and she was like, I don't think so. 
That was really nice. <laughs> she was great. I, mean, I really loved her. And she was also, well, what do you want? And so she gave me Thursdays for myself. And then it got to the point. At that point, it was then only doing editorial. And no longer doing, like, sort of grunt work. Secretarial, was, sort of. Yeah, oh, was it still the same nine staffers no, at that point? Or had uh, it been larger still, or smaller? Uh, well, we were always about nine. Um, yeah. But the only people, my only colleagues from the early days who are still here are Lori Callahan, who was here from before me, who's now the executive vice president, and Cesar Ivers, editor, and um, Declan Spring, who mm -hmm. probably joined about the time that I was given the five-year pitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and did this become, oh, what, was there a moment where you realized this is the place you should be? I think it was cumulative. Like JL, my, M Mr. Lachlan, um, who we all call JL, um, he was very quietly encouraging. And um, when he... In, I was attached to him, and it was um, just hard. He was getting old, and he signed his collected poems to me. You will be a great publisher, I thought. I kind of feel like he got me from there <laughs> yeah, a little bit. And then Griselda was always so encouraging. And, you know, yeah, I don't know, and Peggy Fox was the publisher after Griselda. You know, like, if you came in and you knew, like, the Roberto Bolaño Galley was all over town, and you could come in and say, I swear to God, it's a great author. Um, can I make an offer? Because I think we should offer today and get it in. She would say yes. Mm -hmm. So it's nice. It's, it was a. I mean, we try to do by consensus and discuss everything. But if yeah. there's a, a time, um, constraint, like if you've read something truly great, and I think that's how we got Sable, is we made an offer yeah. for all three books, and because I know that Andre Schifrin said in his book that Sable was around, which I wasn't so aware of that he'd been being shopped around, but um, apparently he said it was, and and I did know a university press person who said, oh my god, we were looking at that for two months, but it always takes us so long. Yeah. So that's a big advantage. And you can imagine with Sebald that a university press would think, oh, this is not quite mainstream, or not even literary fiction in a sense, yeah. you know, might fit our, our world. But we, There's a wonderful, I've sworn um, to, to take this secret to my grave, who said this, but our first reader said, this is too intellectual for Americans. Yeah. Which it, is kind of offensive. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's a little bit. And true. Yeah. You know, well, really. uh, well, he was so, yeah. he uh, spoke to so many people. Well, that's... Without making a Sophie's Choice vibe out of it, whose success surprised you the most of authors that you you published? Or who was like, wow, I cannot believe this took off. You know, I mean, I understand the Bolaño thing, yeah. not what you published, but the the twenty six sixty six yeah. thing. You know, that's that's kind of a difficult phenomenon to imagine. But was there any author you had a? I I love this book, but I I am surprised that it took off as well as it did. I mean. Without offending anyone. Without offending anyone. I think yeah. it's true. Like, Takashi Hiraidi is this wonderful poet. I mean, he's a really... We first published this book that was the joke at the Panheim. The, the title is um, For the Fighting Spirit of the Walnut. But I had to say, when the first judge, you know, you do this rounds, and the first round, I was like, everyone has to read this. This is actually the best thing in my pile. And, um, but he's a very strange and far, somewhat far out poet, and um, kind of this cross-hatching and curious language. And anyhow, so uh, we published this little novel, and um, it's a very peculiar little I novel called The Guest Cat, and I was shocked that that was the book that got on the New York Times bestseller list. And when we sold it to England, I, I mean, my teeth could fall out of my head that they sold 125,000 copies of this very peculiar little yeah. thing. You know, it's about this, these couple that are both one, writers and translators who live at home and their whole lives are changed when this kitty cat starts visiting. Mm -hmm. But it goes off on weird, like, dispositions yeah. about geometry and sulcovitries and, you know, a lot about the transience of life, but, you know, not exactly. Yeah, it's, the, the, it has the a really, stuff of a, a hit. It yeah. has a beautiful pussycat by Fujita on the cover. Um, yeah. and so but still, not, not quite enough of a selling point. To Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, no, the NPR, there was this great Juan Vidal said, even dog lovers will love this book. I was, like, <laughs> I was so happy. But I was like, really? Uh, so yeah, that was to be my single most shocking. Because like, when you read somebody like Laszlo or Cesar, Ira or um, Sebald, you know, maybe on the surface, but they have this deep pull, you know, and so yeah. I can see why they've gotten people. Mm -hmm. Any thought of what Sebald or Sebald would have become, how he would have dealt with, particularly the Bush era since he died, so right at the the cusp of where things went. I'm so, I mean, it's such a pity. That was such a that was right after nine eleven. That yeah. was such an awful year. Um, well, you know, we were we. He was a very kind man, and he would say, "You're still my publisher." And he he 
had become so successful with his um, Austerlitz with Knopf um, that he took me out for lunch. It was very sweet. <laughs> <laughs> that must be a great he rarity. So the cute. author actually. Yeah, he was adorable. But anyhow, um, what, what he indicated, which would have been so interesting to me, and maybe this isn't true, but that he was going to, from what I, un, what I took away from this was that he had a very good friend's grandfather's diary that was written, I think, in Mulberry Juice Inc. And, um, <laughs> and I just remember thinking, God, oh, that's so weird. And, you know, whenever you w- walked away from Max, you'd be like, really now? It's just curious. You try to figure it out and um, what he was saying. But that he, I think particularly in Austerlitz, it becomes that thing of like um, the housekeeper said, um, as Jacques recalled, you know, like this kind of creaking almost of the hinges of this narrator remembering another narrator yeah. and then narrating that. And so it seemed as if not a first-person narrative, but something he was going to do something a little lower to the ground or a little closer to almost an eye narrative. But yeah. that was my sense, and so I couldn't imagine what exactly that would be. Yeah. But all of his books are so distinct. Yeah, you know, yeah it would be tough seemed to like project where some of them back go. to Vertigo a little more, because yeah. Vertigo's kind of a little bit... But um, mm-hmm. hard to say. I think we lost a huge treasure. Yeah. And would the guest cat be the uh, the discovery you're proudest of? Which again, I love. I mean, I love that book. Um, yeah. I'm super happy that we publish. And some of these, you know, predate me. Like we were publishing Clarice Le Spectre in the '70s. Um, I think that was brought to us by Peter Glasgow, the old editor in chief. I'm really crazy about Yoko Tawada, and her fifth book, Memoirs of a Polar Bear, has turned out to be the breakthrough book for her. And it's the first time we've had a um, a UK partner. Portobello Granta picked her up, mm-hmm. and it's, you see her now going into more languages. And she's a really interesting writer who kind of breaks the mold in everything she writes, and she writes in both Japanese and in German, her adopted language, mm-hmm. and has won all the prizes in both. And she's constantly fascinating, so I'm really proud of her. And, you know, Laszlo Krasnohorka, we couldn't be prouder of. Cesar Ira is an amazing writer. Bolaño. I mean, I look at them, uh, there's a wonderful Irish writer named Keith Ridgway, who I'm just dying for him to give us another book. Um, then there's people that people that haven't really read very much yet, like Roger Le Winter. We just published this very strange, poetic, sort of meditative fictions. Um, he's a, he writes in French, but he's a Swiss. And um, Lydia Davis loves him, and a wonderful translator, Rachel Corot, really worked for those for, I think, more than a decade. Mm-hmm. Strange little books, and um, she's busy talking me into this crazy Rilke project where it's being translated from German into French into English. I'm like, hmm. mm-hmm. I'm still wrapping my brain <laughs> yeah, around that. <laughs> and then I have these like loves of like this Uruguayan writer, Phyllis Guerrero Hernandez, and I mean, there's so many of them. I'm really love. Um, I was telling you about Osama Alomar, our Syrian oh, yeah. writer who. Um, he's coming to New York and he's going to do some radio and it's really exciting. He's going to be on the New Yorker Radio Hour and he's going to be on NPR. And for us, that's just a great breakthrough for someone we've only done a pamphlet with but coming out right now is called The Teeth of the Comb and he writes these little parables. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, he's an amazing writer and he's been getting all stars and in fact, just yesterday I asked the production art chief if could you call the printer and print a couple thousand more? Because I just feel like we're going to get stuck, <laughs> yeah. you know, stuck short. And, and you know, he's just a great guy. And who else? Radovan Nassar is new to our list. Is two great little translations. He's a Brazilian classic who had these two huge books in the 1970s, I think, and then quit writing. He's still alive, but he's now he's a done. rancher. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's better than being a lobbyist for the pharmaceutical industry. That's all I can say. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say what you're most proud of. I mean, we publish really wonderful poets, and you know, most of those. Yeah, how's I, the market for selling poetry evolved well, since you, you've been, again, since the mid-'80s here? I mean, it's um, the, it's not a wild card the way – I mean, generally speaking, it's not a wild card the way anything new in translation is where you just have no idea. Right. Like you kind of – we're really proud to publish Michael Palmer and Nate Mackey and Susan Howe and Bernadette Mayer and Rosemary Waldrop. And with these people who are kind of in Forrest Gander, where we publish, we also publish a lot of poetry and translation, but that tends to be like a selected or best of often. Sure. You know? And so um, so for these people who you publish and you publish and you publish, or Ann Carson, you know kind of the size of their audience, and so you can print the right amount. And yeah. so it's a kind of, it's very hard to lose on that proposition. 
you're not making a lot of money, you know. But mm -hmm. but, but yeah. on the other hand, you know, there's also glory. The JL really believed, and it's true, that it's important to get the the within kind of. I mean, we do have you know we've been publishing Lawrence Ferlin Getty since the beginning. We're doing this huge greatest poems, and that's going to be a big money maker, mm -hmm. you know. So so it depends on the poem. Yeah. But um, but JL believed that the one of the most important streams of income for New Directions, and it's certainly true, is to get the best poets of the generations that we're living in, um, who are kind of in this more experimental, that's a baggy, saggy thing, but yes, yeah. kind of in this experimental thing, because he believed greatly in the secondary rights. Mm -hmm. And so it's true, like for many of our authors, like William Carlos Williams, um, he still sells very well in book form, but I'd say his anthology rights earn as much money for us in the estate. Same with Pound. Um, Pound may make more money in the anthologies than secondary rights. So, you know, so there's that, like George Oppen, like these really important poets. Um, we try to think long term and in the future and that these are there. I mean, proudest for me of getting anybody on the poetry list, because JL really didn't need me and didn't want me. I mean, he, I once <laughs> sent him a list of like 10 poets I thought were interesting. And, um, and I got this, no, I just asked, right, did you find any of these interesting? No, not at all, not in the least, somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> and that, <No. laughs> that's a success. <laughs> but he, he let me um, add Bernadette Mayer because he admired her Catullus uh, translations. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think recognized that she was very interesting. Does the New Directions, um, is there a cachet for authors or for poets in particular with the holy I crap I'm getting so. published by the, uh, <laughs> do, but do you, do you get that when so. you're talking to them sometimes? The so. you know, uh, Yeah, I think so. I said so because we tend to be loyal, or we try to be loyal and we mm -hmm. try to, um, you know, do a good job. And one of the reasons that we try not to, I can get overly enthusiastic and acquire too many books and we can get a little carried away with ourselves. And the problem with that is then, the living poets in the pipeline have to wait too long. And right. so you try to keep that artery unclogged as much as possible. And I think that I think that any of the poets who are kind of close to us are aware that we're, we're thinking of them and trying not to do that. Because mm -hmm. um, that, that could happen easily, especially with the amount of translation projects that are kind of waiting in the wings. Mm -hmm. um, if you didn't keep, you know, kind of true to your school that you promised to bring out this much poetry, you could really make people kind of hurt their careers gotcha. and you know, not let them express themselves. I'm really excited. We've recently added Mamie Bersenberger to our list. And she's, I just was hearing her read um, Talia Field, Susan Howe, Michael Palmer, and Mamie all read together. And all of them had something about the stars, but her new book is all about the stars. Cool. It's, it's, it's fantastic, the new poems. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm proud of sneaking P Bernadette past JL. That was, <laughs> that was great. Um, you know, it's hard not to, I mean, one thing I'd have to say is that we all work together on um, this project, and so my colleagues like Tynan and Lori and Declan and Mika and Eric, I mean, we all read all of them, and Chris reads Spanish for us. Um, so we're all in it together, and we're all pulling together, and everybody brings it. You know, it's like there's so many rabbits bouncing around, and, mm -hmm. you know, you can only have so many rabbits and, you know, that are going to become New Directions rabbits. So the rabbit hunting is constant, <laughs> but you, be, yeah. you need to feel like it's, like, both kind of up our alley, which is always a debate, and then um, also that enough people really love it. And, yeah. I guess that's that's my question. How is, or do you feel that up our alley mm -hmm. has evolved in the course of your 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 tenure at the, the top here? Or do you, or is it again largely? You know, do you think it's keeping in spirit with what JL I mean, was? Yeah. JL's idea was that New Directions exists for writers, experimental writers, to make their experiments and publish mm -hmm. in, in public. Excuse me. And so, that's really still like we we try to find things that kind of expand our notion or move the walls in our brain around a little bit about what fiction can do. And so, and poetry. Um, and so. So in that that's respect, really you, what you stuck with we're what the, yeah. the okay. That's what I was just wondering. I guess yeah. has the the um, the mission. I, I hate to use corporate yeah. speak, but you know, has has the mission evolved at all, or does it really, you know, is it was it so firmly you know set that it's not difficult to say no, this isn't really a new directions book. We have these crazy you know. conversations here. I mean, like, yeah. don't you think this is a little too commercial for new directions? Yeah, that's that's what yeah. I'm wondering. Yeah. Are there yeah. moments you know, part of, of the me is like, yeah. well, it'd be really nice to make some money. But in fact, we have done a couple of books, and I don't want to say which ones, but um, where they are excellent books in a generally you know on every sort of 
regular narrative sense, and but they aren't unusual. They're not doing something sure. you haven't seen before. They're doing an excellent job at more classic things and maneuvers. And um, in in both cases, these two books, I'm thinking if we did no favor to anyone, yeah. we didn't do a favor to the author, we confused the bookstores. The reviewers right. kind of were like, huh? Me? And yeah. so it's much better for us if we, um, I mean, we try to, like, this is a great book that's just coming out by Matthias Einard, which we bought right before it won the Prix Goncourt, thank God, called Compass. And Chuck, um, I'm sorry, um, Chad Post had published two at Open Letter, particularly this one we really loved called Zone. And um, so in that case, and we really try not to do that, just to kind of horn in on other people's books, like we really try not to do that. But um, that was a case where we did. Um, and I feel like he needs, he should be getting more credit than he's getting as, mm. as a publisher. He's brought a lot of great people like this Bulgarian novelist, uh, Georgi Gospinov, um, and just various writers um, over. And so, wait, I kind of went off on a tangent. Um, uh, within your mission, publishing something that was a little more conventional than oh, you thought oh, of? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay. No, and so, so there's people I really admire, but that um, I, I sometimes need to take a step back and say, wow, that's an excellent book, and I'm so glad I read it, but it doesn't mean, need to be on our list. Sure. That it would do better at a book, at a house with a wider fiction list mm -hmm. and that with a marketing department who kind of knows how to pitch a book like that. Now, when it comes to translation, um, is there an underserved region or language that Jeez. you really want to, or, or that you think needs more attention? Yeah. Um, we are completely um, blank on African literature, mm -hmm. except for North African. Um, we have some really important and great Egyptian, Sonala Ibrahim, um, Kalido, you know, we have some really great, Moro we're bringing out a great Buonini, a great Moroccan um, soon, both his poetry and his fiction. Um, so North Africa, we're good, but uh, continental Africa, terrible. Um, we And not just New Directions, you mean the American market overall? Well, we particularly suck. But okay. um, yeah, there's some, uh, Grey Wolf brought out a book I really love called Black Ass. That was really great. He was a Nigerian writer. And um, uh so, no, we're worse than most people on that score. Though, okay. yeah, I'd say that's the most But not racist understood. or anything. I'm just kidding. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I only say that because I once went a full year without a non-white guest on this show without uh -huh. realizing until yeah. I looked at it and thought, this would look so bad if I was a non-white potential guest saying, oh, I wonder who they've had on this yeah. show and realizing, yeah, nice white podcast. So, well, I, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. No, so we've got nothing to look, mm -hmm. you know, proud about in that area. And then... Well, one of the most remarkable books that I've read ever, and I wanted to publish, but I was too late, um, is a book called Carpinteria by Alexis Wright. Mm -hmm. She's an Australian and an Aboriginal writer. And um, it's the most incredible book. Simon Schuster brought it out. Each year brought it out. Um, it really does dimensional things to your thinking about space and time that are subtle and a lot like dream paintings. And um, she's remarkable. She has another book called, I think, Black Swan. Um, anyhow, so that's an area that um, we have no Native American writers. Mm -hmm. I guess Jimmy Sani Abaka is part Native American. Um, no, I mean, it's pretty bad. We have a lot of Asian writers. We have a lot of European writers. We have a lot of South American writers, mm -hmm. Mexican writers. But, um, so Indonesia, we got Indonesia on the map. That was Something, good. You know. Yeah, you know, so we try. but um, And we follow the... We try to follow the African prizes and, and you know, we look. But mm -hmm. it's that combination of either not being fast enough or not feeling quite right for our list. And so sure. Is there a, a, a Frankfurt for African literature or is it pretty much everything is done in Frankfurt for the book fair? I don't know. You know, we don't go to Frankfurt. Oh, I've really? Been, I've, oh. I've been to Frankfurt once where clearly someone had died and they needed somebody on the panel <laughs> the next week. Um I think somebody must have dropped off of another American publisher who publishes a mm -hmm. lot of fiction cause, in translation because they needed somebody to talk about the American situation, which has improved since then. That was like eight years ago. Yeah. And um, before those small presses I was mentioning have gotten very active. Right. And so, yeah. oh, I had wondered, and it actually leads into my, my big question for this whole thing. Uh, I interviewed Galassi a couple of years ago because he mm -hmm. wrote his first novel. Um, mm -hmm. With JL as a, a fictionalized character and Roger Strauss also. Uh, a, is there a, no a novel? Uh -uh. In you? <laughs> no? 
you know, I write a little, but I don't think a novel. Okay. <laughs> and there, there's no Ramana Clough about this whole no, New no, Directions? Like and, and, okay. <laughs> Everyone's safe from that. <laughs> Everyone's definitely safe from that. Because the best part of that book, and, and there was uh, good stuff in it, but he, he manages a set piece at Frankfurt mm-hmm. Book Fair that, that's really – Perfect. Good stuff, but, yeah. but but again, it's all from some schlub from New Jersey reading it who doesn't have a, a direct experience with any of this. But you know, outside of the trade show vibe, which is the one uh-huh. thing I got from uh, yeah. that side of it. But um, the other big question: the reason we're we're talking initially, you are the uh, recipient of the Friedrich Olfers Prize this year, yes. which is sort of why we're touching on translation mm-hmm. in, in a lot of different ways. Um, can you talk about the the significance? Of it, and particularly New Directions work with German language literature, which is what this is. Well, I have to say, it's incredibly generous. This is the first time that I've ever gotten a word with money attached. Well, that's my next question. What are you planning on doing with the dough? That's. Uh... <laughs> I came to work, and a I found out it's taxable, which was like damn. Yeah. But um, yeah, and I, and I looked at my car- colleagues, and I said, "Well, I was thinking about sharing it, but I decided not to." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm bad. I'm, I want to go to Japan, so I think I'm going to spend it going to Japan in April. Well, it's a, it's publicly known, so we can talk about how much money. It's five thousand yeah, dollars. That's very that's nice. so after tax, say thirty five hundred or so. But yeah. that's trip to Japan. I'm down. Uh, that, yeah. that literally is any plans for award dough is yeah. one of the, the yeah. notes. <laughs> no, I've, I, I've probably already spent it in real life, but yeah. it's officially going to take me to Japan. Um, it's but, just great because he's done this for. I mean, it's interesting because mostly the prizes we get are strictly for publishing. Mm-hmm. So this is a prize that really should go to translators and has gone to translators. Mm-hmm. It's awfully nice of. Did you feel guilty in that respect because you only have English? No. Winning a, a prize in translation? Okay. <laughs> yeah. That shame has been so lifelong. I've kind of, you know how you can have a shame that gets on so long that it gets boring. I've kind of mm-hmm. got bored with it. But, um, What's the one language you wish you had? Oh, any of them. I studied French for like seven yeah, but, years. But, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Is, there, is there one in particular you think, my God, I wish I could read X in, in I mean, the original? If anything, I mean, in a weird way, Japanese. Yeah. Yeah. But it's even further from all possibility. Yeah. yeah no, I'm just yeah. again in wish yeah. fulfillment world. Uh, if there's one there's that you so wish you had. There's so many of my favorite writers are Japanese. It would be so interesting to read them in the original. How did you start with uh, Japanese literature? You know the usual, like reading Kawabata and Tanizaki when you're mm-hmm. a kid. Actually, I think I grew up with these uh, Japanese folk tales, and Chinese folk tales, and folk tales yeah. of India. You know, so I think that's kind of started it off. But, I had um, the five Chinese brothers when I was a little kid. I that, that was book. that was. I forget who I was talking about. That was some past guest, probably a cartoonist. One who drinks the sea. Yeah, yeah. 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 I loved it. Anyway, so it's just not. It's great of them. I think it's because of. Um, I have this sneaking suspicion that Professor Ulfers must love Robert Balzer. Because we've done so much Robert yeah. Balzer, I have this feeling. I'm and I was just corrected and told he's Swiss and not German. He, but German But writes in German. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're allowed to promote uh, German. Like. Probably, Jessa Crispin set me straight because I'd, I'd mentioned, uh, you know, where I should go when I'm in Germany uh-huh. this, this fall. And I said, you know, I guess I should start reading Walzer. She's like, he's Swiss. I'm like, God damn it. I, I've got just, <laughs> you know. But, yeah, I mean, we've been, published some books that are obscure but are so great, like Regina Ullman, this very strange Swiss writer from 1920s, and she was in the... She was kind of a country bumpkin who ended up in the circles of Rilke, and Thomas Mann thought she was a genius. And it's it, she's completely forgotten now. And yeah. a Swiss publisher talked me into that one, and I love that book. And poets love that book. A lot of um, like Susan Howe loves that book. Um, but I think Yoko Tawada in German, and all the Zabel, and we've done a lot of Joseph Roth. And so yeah. I think he must like these writers. <laughs> I think it's a, he, <laughs> we must be working up his alley somehow. We've done a lot of Uwe Tim. And, a lot of German authors. We did, and doing a new Alexander Kluge, he's such an interesting writer. In mm-hmm. many ways, um, and Zebald says this, um, was sort of the precursor to some of that fictionalized with historical yeah. um, photos and stuff. Yeah, do, do you have a recollection of your first experience with Zebald reading that yeah. work and just having a, uh, I don't, this is different than anything I've read well, previously? This is so marvelous. Yeah. Well, Claudia Steinberg told me that I should read him. And then I noticed TLS in London, TLS used to do this more than it does now. I wish it would go back to doing more of it, which would be to give small but acute reviews of books in other languages. Mm-hmm. And so I'd seen... Not yet in translation. Not yet in translation. Okay. Yeah. And I'd seen The Emigrants um, when it was published in German and it had such um, a positive review. And so we kind of cast around and we had that one reader who said, who's a great guy, but he said it's too intellectual for Americans. And then I sent it to Rosemary Waldrop, one of our poets who also is from Germany. And she was like, you have to publish this immediately. 
Like, wow. don't miss a moment. Just get it. Mm-hmm. And um, and only later did she tell me that her maiden name is Zabald and that they're actually somehow <laughs> <laughs> cousins. Is there some German saying around three corners or something? <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then the funny thing is that when we got the um, the translation, it was from Michael Hulse, and it was in association with um, Harville and McElhouse, Christopher McElhouse, and it came, and of course it didn't have the photos in it yet. Oh. It, was the, it was a sample draft of the first part. Mm-hmm. So it was like, I had to really read it with the German edition. So it, you'd know where to, it, to break it, kind into of these. Like yeah. where they had, or yeah. even just roughly. Yeah. But you know, I was completely seduced immediately. And that was very exciting because, you know, it's one of those things where you buy it before you've really seen a sample because there was some pressure on them not to sure. lose him. So, um, yeah. And sometimes it's the other way around. You get what you thought was going to be a great book and you're like, Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> a strong first, although that happens in English too. Strong first chapter, which you realize was a novel pitch and then it all kind of. Yeah. yeah. And or workshopped as a translation. Yeah. Yeah. Biggest hassle working with translators or just things that translators don't necessarily get about publishing as uh-huh. opposed to strictly translating. You know, it's. I think it's just functions of time and money sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, so you can't complain too much. But yeah. occasionally, people, um, yeah, my beef would be people having children. <laughs> <laughs> it's always like, well, I had a baby, and I'm like, oh god, here we go. Yeah. And it's you know, for boys and girls, it's, it's mm-hmm. equally. I'm sorry, there is a deadline. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so no, I mean, I think translators are pretty amazing people and pretty selfless and give an enormous amount. And when you think about people like Margaret Joel Costa, who we've, we've worked on a lot of books together and how much she gets done and how brilliant they all are. It's weird. It's like they, that was my experience with Anthea Bell. Yeah. I'm sitting there, I'm looking at the stack of her books. I'm like, I wouldn't have had time to read these, much less translate them. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Margaret's amazing. New directions in 10 years. Well, the plan is, I'm trying to, um, my goal, my real help, the, the thing about um Declan looks like 20 years younger than me, but he's just five years younger than me. And then Lori's my age, you're a little older. And so the biggest thing that we need to make sure we're doing is bringing up the next generation. Mm -hmm. And it's such a whack job. I mean, it really is. The way you figure out how this could work financially and then sticking to it and enjoying it and not making it be like a burden um, is learn like people like JL's knee and Griselda's knee but yeah. this is not this is fine it's easy in mm-hmm. a way you know like they get that feeling and and, a, and that sense of what that baggy saggy is this an indie book or not which seems so stupid and it, it is I mean it's so like having your you know, head up your whatever um you know it's to make sure that it's flowing forward and the best thing that's happening at New Directions right now is we have never had such a good staff and I see the next generation now it's a question of how you, you could shackle them. <laughs> so yeah, that's the, yeah, we have to figure out a way to get the whole ball and chain out and make sure that they think it's worthwhile. But, um, yeah, mm-hmm. that's the main thing. I mean, when you look down the road, you just think the the problems for a company like New Directions is that in we're, we're built on the fact we used to get life of copyright. Mm-hmm. You know, and it doesn't exist anymore? Zabold was the last you know major author that we got life of copyright on. Um, uh, poets and translators, we have usually get like term of copyright for their work, but um, almost no foreign publishers and no agents will give you more mm-hmm. than 15 years. And it's a struggle sometimes to get 15 years. I think some of the big houses sometimes still get life of copyright, but must have to pony up a great deal more money. And so it's just hard because what traditionally happens then is agents will wait and then once those, they, you know, it just becomes a shell game. So the next, you know, you become the, and this happens to all small publishers who discover new writers, you know, you're basically working as a talent scout for yeah, the minor leagues, in a sense, uh, which I don't mean in a derogatory way, but no. you get used like that. So, yeah. well, I will leave you to figure out your your succession <laughs> plans and and you know how to keep those kids around. I hope so. Wish me luck. And Barbara, thanks so much for coming on the Virtual Thank Memory you. Show. Thank you. And that was Barbara Appler. She's the publisher of New Directions, and you just need to look over their catalog sometime to realize how many great authors they've published over the years and and how they've managed to do it without the, we'll say, temptation to go corporate and, and, you know, get bought up and go large. Um, It's really a wonderful story, that press, and I'm, I'm so happy I got to sit down with Barbara and I got to experience the whole place, you know. 
Uh, so anyway, Barbara is smartly not on Facebook or Twitter, um, which is probably how she can be so productive. You can follow New Directions through either of those venues. Just look up New Directions, maybe publishing. Uh, you can also hit ndbooks.com to find out more about their upcoming works, backlist, events around their, their books, etc. And I want to thank Barbara, but I also want to thank the Festival New Literature, which I always mispronounce, and their organizers for getting us together and for just letting me be part of their annual event. You can find out more about the festival by visiting festivalnewliterature.org. New is N-E-U-E, -E, and literature is pretty much literature, except it doesn't have an E at the end. Festival is festival. Good luck. There'll be a link in the show notes. You'll see how to do it there. I was supposed to record with one of the German authors. They flew in for the event this weekend, but um, about five minutes away from home as I was headed into the city Sunday morning, I got an email from her. And yes, I occasionally check my email while driving. I'm trying to do it less and less, um, saying she got laryngitis and had to beg off. So it's a good thing I check my email while I'm driving sometimes. Um, anyway, we're hoping to connect when I have business in Germany later this year. Um, because I hate doing all that work and research and not getting a podcast out of it, you know? Anyway, once we wrapped up the main session, I asked Barbara, so, who are you reading? If you want to hear her answer to that, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show so you can get access to our monthly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. You can do that at patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for supporters of the show, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, which is weird and creepy. Uh, I'm looking to launch a series of ebooks, although my translator has dis or my uh, uh, transcriber has disappeared, and more. So go to Patreon.com/vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. This one was recorded at the New Directions offices in Manhattan, and as is my wont, I parked at Empire Parking on West 96th Street and took the subway down. So that involved a toll at the GW, about 20 bucks for parking, $6 round trip on the subway, and coffee over at Birch, which is one of my faves. That was probably 5 or $6, but they make a really good pour over. And they seem to remember me, even though I don't go in there that often. I am the weird guy who carries the big leather case with a studio in it, so maybe it's kind of memorable. Anyway, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the Virtual memory Show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, um, somebody to polish and clean my nice leather case, whatever, visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Paul W. Jones, Kevin Katila, Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Zach Martin, Craig P. Steffen, and Ron Slate for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We've got the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. David's got a reunion project going with his great 80s band, David and David, and you can find out more and try to support that at facebook.com slash David and David Music. And that's it for this week's Virtual memory Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with Jeff Nunakawa, professor of English at Princeton and author of Notebook. Until next time, you can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store or at soundcloud.com slash vmspod. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. And if you like this show, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and review for this podcast. That'll help us build a bigger audience. Until next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. Mm -hmm.